So two topics for today. First topic is what I would call testing the fit of a distribution. And this is kind of slightly related to what we talked about in the previous couple lectures of like hypothesis testing and so on, right? The setup is that we are collecting some experimental data, right? And then we want to determine, okay, how well does this experimental data fit a underlying model of a PDF, right? So um, the idea is, you know, we collect experimental data coming from a random process. And we want to know um, how good is the fit to a kind of a proposed distribution. So hypothesis testing is kind of like this. I mean, so hypothesis testing gives us kind of like this binary yes or no answer if I say, okay, you know, here is my significance level, for example, and I want to know am I able to reject the null hypothesis or not, I kind of get this binary yes or no answer, but it doesn't quite quantify in a numerical sense how good the fit is. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. So, um, you know, the idea is um, hypothesis testing is kind of like this. Uh, but it doesn't give us a quantitative result. You know, kind of what I want is a number that says how good was the fit, okay? So an easy thing I could do is I could take my experimental data and I could kind of maybe, for example, make a histogram. Supposing, supposing this was just like a discrete random variable, rolling a die, right? So I could look at all of the die rolls from one to six and I could add up uh, how often that happened, right? So an easy way is to kind of um, look at the histogram of the experiment data and then I compare this to kind of what it should look like. Right? So suppose I'm rolling a die, right, and I know that the numbers that can come up are one through six. So I could make a table that says something like, you know, this is my random variable, this is the frequency that I observed it, and this is kind of my model for what it should be uh, if this was a fair die. Right, so my possible um, outcomes are one through six, and my model, if this was a fair die, would say that each of these things is probable with probability one-sixth. Right? Now you say, okay, I rolled the die 10,000 times and I computed the probability experimentally of each of those things happening and what I got was some other observed random variable or some observed uh, frequencies like this. And so, you know, I kind of want to ask myself, are these numbers, are these empirical frequencies consistent with my underlying hypothesis that this is a uniform distribution, right? Um, you know, it looks pretty close, right? I mean, I'm in the ballpark, but you know, like, this number is a little bit high, this number is a little bit low, and so the question is, you know, how could I kind of uh, tell how close was close enough, right? So I'm going to talk about that uh, concretely in just a second. So it's kind of easy to see kind of how I might generate these tables for a discrete random variable. If I'm in a continuous world, I could do something similar, right? Um, so uh, for a continuous random variable, I could do something similar. So what I could do is I could chop up the PDF into a bunch of intervals, and then I could count how often the observed random variable fell into those intervals. So 
um, you know, I could chop up the um, PDF's domain, the x-axis, um, into k disjoint intervals and compare the observed frequencies versus the um, model probability in each interval. So what do I mean by that? So suppose I have some sort of a, you know, PDF like this. What I could do is I could say, okay, I'm just gonna chop up this PDF into six intervals, right? And I'm gonna count how often does the random variable observed fall into each of these bins, right? And then I could compare the actual model probabilities by computing, for example, you know, I could integrate over just this region, the PDF, sorry, the PDF in that region, right? That's just like the probability of being in interval I, okay? So just one caveat is that it kind of makes more sense when I'm doing this chopping up to do so not by just equally chopping up along the x-axis, but instead by thinking about making equally probable ranges of x, right? So we kind of talked about this in the, uh, I guess when we talk about quantizers, and even there was like a homework problem on this, right, of saying how could I find uh, points on the x-axis that divide the PDF into equally probable areas? So um, let me just say that uh, probably better to use equally probable regions. Right, so suppose that I've got like a um, Gaussian-ish distribution. Well, if I were to chop up, you know, like this region, you know, suppose I was just to take little inch long segments of each of these things, well, this segment would have very low probability and this segment would have very high probability. So in, most of the time I'd be getting stuff that falls into the middle bins, and I'd kind of be wasting an interval, right? So kind of what I might want to do is to say, I'm going to chop up these things, so each of these, if I was thinking about like six intervals, so maybe I do this in such a way that each of these uh, areas has one-sixth of the probability, right? Instead of kind of having these misshapen, uneven probabilities. I mean, it doesn't really matter that much, but I think it's a better way to do it, okay? So now I've kind of reduced everything to a setting where I can compare a table of what I saw against what I expect, okay? So that's the setup. So any questions or comments about this so far? Okay, so how would we then do this comparison, okay? So, uh, so now we have a table of observed frequencies and let's call those um, A sub K. And then we have a table of um, kind of expected or model probabilities P sub K, okay? So how can we use these things to kind of put everything together, okay? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna define what's called the test statistic. And I'm just looking at this now that, um, and let's suppose, you know, suppose we um, do, you know, N experiments. So N is the number of times that we did the experiment. Okay. Okay. 
So then basically what I expect is um, we see uh, n a sub k um, outcomes in bin k, and we expect there to be uh, n p sub k outcomes. And so the d, or the d squared statistic, is defined as, this is uh, number of bins, 1 over n p sub k, n a k minus n p k. And actually, I can see that the way I wrote this, I can simplify this a little bit. So it's kind of basically a difference between what I got and what I expected uh, weighted by the probability. So actually, if I just divide through by n, what I get is this, OK? So this is kind of like saying that, OK, all I'm doing is I'm looking at the average uh, difference between what I saw and what I expect, and then I am weighting that by the probability of being in each bin, right? So if the probability is higher, then basically, you know, the d squared contribution is closer to zero, right? So here, this is kind of like a weight according to what's going on in each bin. Um, but more or less, it's like the kind of sum of square differences between what I saw and what I expect. Dif this is like bad spelling. So kind of one way to think about this is that since we don't see a lot of, uh, you know, stuff coming up in lower frequency bins, I want to weight the stuff that I do see there a little bit more. Now, if I do, if I do this already where everything was equally probable, then basically this number is all the same, and this number is the same, and so all I'm doing is basically saying how far am I from a uniform distribution. So if I already had done this as a kind of a previous step, then I wouldn't have to worry about the weighting of the bins. Okay. And so now what I want to do is I've got this number. This is kind of just like saying, you know, what is my, you know, weighted uh, sum of square differences. And now I can compare that to a table, for example. So this d squared, um, you know, so let me just start again. So when I do a lot of trials, then what I expect to happen is that this d squared, uh, can be shown to be what's called a chi-squared random variable. With, there's a parameter for this, and then the parameter is related to k, where k equals the number of bins, degrees of freedom. Okay. So this is one of those special PDFs that we give a name to. We didn't talk about it too much in this class, but it is something that we have a name for. And there are tables of this chi-squared probability for its PDF and its CDF, kind of similar to the Q tables that you've been working on for a while. Okay. So the idea is that if the fit is good, then this D squared will be small. And now we can kind of use the tools that we had in the past couple of lectures to say, okay, now I'm going to kind of decide, okay, um, you know, can I be sure that this data came from the distribution that I modeled it as, right? So now we can kind of do like a significance test similar to what we talked about last time, right? So um, we can do a significance test like last time. on the value of this d squared, okay? So in a very similar setup, the idea would be to say, okay, I let alpha be the significance level related to the probability of false alarm, right? Basically, I want to say alpha is the number that I want to make sure that I'm setting in terms of rejecting the null hypothesis, right? So then I can find the uh, threshold 
let's call it tau, such that the probability that um, d squared is above a threshold is equal to alpha, right? That's like saying, what's the probability that I am uh, actually the null hypothesis and I reject it, right? So um, this is under the hypothesis that this d squared is this chi-squared type of random variable. So this little symbol means distributed-like, or has the model, a chi-squared random variable that has k minus one degrees of freedom. So basically, if d squared is greater than the threshold, then what that's saying is that I reject the hypothesis that the samples are from the model distribution. And otherwise, I think that they're okay. So otherwise, we can, uh, the distribution we can say is kind of consistent consistent at this kind of alpha percentage significance level. So this kind of just provides a general guideline of saying, okay, you know, this d squared value is generally going to be low, and I'm setting a threshold to say, okay, above this point, you can reject the, you know, possibility that the samples actually came from that distribution, right? When d squared is too big, then I say that's just not consistent enough with what I think could happen, okay? So this is kind of just a rule of thumb that lets you determine, okay, you know, um, for example, you know, suppose I did a lot of testing for some sort of training data, you know, I, I set up a fake cell phone tower and I looked at all the traffic and I set up a model for, you know, time of arrival of packets, right? And then I, took that cell tower out into the field, and I put it up, and I left it there for a year, and now I look at my data again, I say, okay, well, this is what I saw. Is it really consistent with the way I had it when I set it up in the lab, right? Does it follow the same distribution, yes or no? And I can kind of have a threshold that says whether that's happened or not, right? Okay, so comments or questions about this? So again, you know, these d squared values, you know, this threshold, comes from a table that is similar to the Q table, right? So if you needed to figure out, okay, how much, uh, you know, how much probability is there in the tail of this chi-square random variable, there are tables, and I think they're probably actually in the book, that you can use just in the same way that you use a Q table, right? So it's, it's very much the same kind of thing. And again, this isn't really a, you know, this is certainly not a statistics class, um, but this is the kind of thing that you maybe might spend more time on if you were taking a class like Mao, for example, where you were, looking at tables and tables of data, and you were trying to answer hypotheses and, and analyze the data, right? So I think that they probably do a little bit more of that type of analysis in the modeling analysis of uncertainty class that's, I guess, in ISYE, or maybe it's in DSES? Yep. No, this is, this is purely for your information. I'm not gonna ask you any D squared questions on the exam, because we haven't done any homework problems on it, right? So, Yes, to, to forestall the questions, is this on the exam, right? So basically, you know, uh, this stuff is more, I think, so you'll, you can see, for example, that there are, on some back exams, one of them has kind of got like a fill in the blank question about like, you know, what would you do in this case kind of thing, and that's where this kind of thing might come into play, where you would know what is the right test to apply, or what is the name of this, you know, why is this chi-square random variable get used, it gets used in significant, so that, that's the level of stuff that you need to know for this, right? Uh, I don't feel good about asking you really detailed questions on stuff that we didn't do a homework problem on. Yeah. So it's more for your own intellectual development. Other questions? Okay. So now let's get to the final part, which I think is kind of, um, you know, interesting, and, uh, you know, it comes down to how, you know, how to actually generate random variables, or how to generate samples 
from a given distribution. Um, you know, so this comes up a lot, right? I'm a communications engineer, and I'm trying to make a model for my noise that's coming to my system, and I say, oh, okay, this is a rarely distributed random variable, similar to what you did in the last homework, right? Um, I have to generate some values that are consistent with that PDF. How do I do it, right? Um, well, everything comes down to the whole, any, generation of any random variable comes down to being able to generate uniform random variables, right? So everything relies on being able to generate um, uniform random variables that are between zero and one. If I can do that, I can do anything, okay? Now, if any of you have ever taken a, I'm not sure where you've learned this in a computer science curriculum, but certainly uh, maybe cryptography would be a place that you might learn this a little bit. So in practice, you know, no computer is gonna generate truly random variables, right? Um, you know, every random number generation algorithm is actually a deterministic method that will basically generate the same random variable, or the same numbers in the same order uh, if it's all started in the same place, right? So maybe if you've ever heard of like the seed of a random number generator, if I start the random number generator with the same seed, that means it will generate a whole bunch of random variables and they all look pretty random, but they're produced exactly the same way every time and because there's, a, there's an explicit rule that says, how do I get the next one from the previous one, right? Now these rules can be very complicated, so it could be that I'm taking you know, the previous 10 random variables and using them to make the 11th, but it's still deterministic, right? And also, you know, the period of this generator, the number of values I get before the whole thing repeats is generally huge, you know, it could be like, you know, two to the 30 second power before I get back to the beginning, right? And so, um, in practice, in the real world, um, the way that something like MATLAB is doing it um, is that we generate some sort of a, um, you know, we get a kind of a, uh, let's say an m bit uh, integer using some sort of deterministic rule starting from some sort of a, a seed. Um, so basically, this thing that is not random but repeats after a very long period. Right, so the idea is I generate some sort of integer and then I divide that integer by say two to the m power to get some sort of floating point number. Now there are lots of ways to do this, and actually the way I just said here where I'm generating an integer and dividing it by a number, you know, there are some that actually generate directly floating point values. And so if you're interested in learning more about this, um, actually one of the creators of MATLAB, um, you know, has written up some details. I, I put this on Piazza about how MATLAB is actually generating uh, random numbers. Let me just see, how can I make this uh, larger? Right, so this is just a short little discussion that's kind of interesting that talks about how this works, right? So for example, what I might do is I might take the previous random number, multiply it by a number, add something, and take the mod, and I get the next random number, right? So that kind of thing, you know, uh, will produce a consistent, you know, set of things that look pretty random, but it's entirely deterministic. And so here's more complicated ones where I'm l using like the previous two random numbers to generate the next one, right? So. Uh, you know, it's interesting to read this a little bit about the details about how this works. Um, and uh, if you, I, I'm not sure there's a lot of actual uh, information in uh, MATLAB's help files on this th these days. There used to be more, but this document that I put on Piazza and that you can find online just by Googling like MATLAB random number generator uh, is kind of interesting to read, okay? Uh, and so I think that the only way that you can generate um, real random numbers is, you know, to look at like the 
uh, emissions of some sort of radioactive source, right? Something that is a naturally occurring random number generator that uh, for all intents and purposes is impossible to predict, right? But of course, that nuclear source is not inside MATLAB. So um, again, this is the kind of thing that uh, of course is very uh, exploitable. So those of you that are interested in like cryptography, you know, there have been instances where codes have been cracked because you kind of know or can figure out where was the random number generator starting, and then you can kind of reverse engineer something about the code, right? So this stuff is actually pretty interesting, but a little bit beyond uh, a course on probability. But let's just say that, let's take it for granted that I can generate these random numbers, right? That's what MATLAB's rand function does. So uh, MATLAB's rand function will generate um, some random number in this uniform range between zero and one, okay? So how can I kind of bootstrap that to go from this basic distribution to any distribution I want, okay? So the easiest way to do it is via the CDF, okay? So, um, so how to go from this to some other distribution. Well, first of all, just generating discrete random variables like binomial whatever is easy. Okay, so how does that work? So um, generating discrete random variables is easy. So let's suppose that I, um, you know, uh, we need the CDF of the function of the distribution. So for example, um, let's suppose I have a binomial distribution where I do uh, five coin flips with a fair coin, okay? The CDF of this looks like um, there are six possibilities. And I can go from zero to one. So I know that eventually I, I start at zero over here and I've accumulated all my probability up here. And I know that like this has relatively low probability. This has a little bit more. Then I take a big step and another big step and a little step and a little step, something like this, right? So it's not exactly, you know, it's certainly not uniform, it's not even, right? And so if I were to look at my um, PDF or CDF as a table, I could say, okay, here is my PMF and here is my CDF and here are my possible values and the PDF for each of these guys is something I can get from the binomial distribution. This is just the usual binomial coefficients. And then the CDF is kind of like the accumulation of these things, right? So I accumulate probability until I add up to one. Okay. And so the way that I use the uniform random variable to get the binomial random variable is very simple. What I do is I generate a uh, random variable somewhere on this axis, right? So uh, the idea is to um, generate this uniform random variable in zero, one and create uh, intervals based on the CDF, right? So that's like saying that if I'm within zero and one thirty second, then I say the binomial random variable was zero. If I say that I'm within one thirty second and six thirty second, then I declare one and so on. So it's basically just like kind of setting a range for each of these guys. And you should be able to convince yourself that this should work, right? 
because the probability of each of these bins is the same as the probability for the binomial. So all I'm doing is I'm splitting up the unit interval into these um, six places. And depending on where I go, I declare this is zero, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, right? So hopefully that makes sense. Comments or questions about, about this? So now I can go from a continuous uniform random variable to any discrete random variable that I want using just this stair-steppy version of the CDF, right? And the same idea applies when I've got a continuous random variable. So any continuous random variable is the same idea, except instead of having a discrete set of categories, I just look at the CDF on the y-axis and I follow my way over onto the x-axis. So um, what am I talking about? So let's just say, same idea. for generating uh, continuous random variables. Right? So if we have the CDF, then the process is the following. First, I generate my uniform random variable. some uniform random variable. And then I let my random variable I want, I look at the inverse CDF of this thing, right? What do I mean? It's like saying I have the, you know, CDF of my random variable that has to go between zero and one, and I generate U over here, say I get this value, and then I follow it over here and then this number here gives me the x value, right? That's all it is. So basically I'm generating stuff on this axis, I'm following it over to get stuff on the other axis. So let me just do an example of that. So let's suppose I wanna generate exponential random variables. So let's suppose that um, x is exponential. And so what does that mean? My CDF, if you remember, is basically one minus e to the minus lambda x, okay? And so that's like saying, okay, I am going to say u is equal to one minus e to the minus lambda x, and I'm gonna solve for x in terms of u, right? So that means that uh, one minus u equals e to the minus lambda x, which means that log of one minus u is minus lambda x, which means that x is minus one over lambda log of one minus u. So this is a transformation that I can use to go from the uniform random variables that I got to the exponential random variables that I want. And so the process is that the exponential CDF looks something like this, that kind of has an asymptote over here. And I generate u over here, and I'm just following it over to figure out what is the x value, okay? That's like the inverse of the value of the CDF, okay? So let's just do a quick example in MATLAB to, to convince myself that this works, right? So if I pop over to MATLAB for a second, so, Again, you know, the rand function, no, not the and function, the rand function just gives me some random number. And I'm pretty sure, let's just see if this still works. So here, this is 0.8147. I'm pretty sure that if I were to restart MATLAB and do it again, let's see if I get the same random number. Yeah, so not so random, right? Because it seems that MATLAB is gonna give me the same sequence of random numbers every time I start up MATLAB, right? So uh, sometimes it might be a good idea if you want true randomness, not true randomness, but the most random stuff possible, maybe you want to, um, you know, 
so there's a whole bunch of uh, details about what you can do, actually. If the documentation is set up in this machine, which it may, it may not be. Right, so this basically is saying, you know, how to use RAND. And there is something called RNG that will let you specify where the random number generator starts, right? So for example, you might want to, if you were doing an experiment where you wanted to make sure you got the same results every time, then it's okay if you get the same sequence of random numbers, or you might say, okay, um, why don't you just make a new random number that depends on the current time, right? That's pretty random, and that will then produce a different sequence of numbers every time you start using RNG. And so there's lots of details about, you know, uh, you know, the way that MATLAB is under the hood generating these uniform numbers, that's what that little article is about. So you might take a look at that because I think it's kind of interesting. So, um, okay, so we got our random number, and so what I could do is I could make a whole bunch of uniform random numbers. Here it's saying, give me 10,000 uniform random numbers, right? And if I look at the histogram of that, and I ask for 40 bins of histogram, I get something that hopefully should look pretty uniform. You know, not too bad, right? And actually, this is a good illustration of the first part of the lecture, is that if I wanted to, I could go back and say, well, this is not totally flat. You know, if it was totally flat, I would get 250 uh, values in every bin, but here I'm getting some a little bit more, some a little bit less. So how, how sure could I be that MATLAB is giving me truly uniform numbers? I could use the stuff from the first part of the lecture with this d squared statistic, right? Anyway, so here's my uniform numbers, and now what I just told you uh, in the other paper slides was to say, okay, if I wanted to make exponential random variables, Let's suppose that I say that lambda is equal to 2, and I do this transformation that's based on the CDF of the exponential random variable. Now, if I look at the histogram of this random variable, this should give me something that looks like a exponential PDF, right? So I took the uniform, I turned it into exponential. That looks pretty good. And I can kind of verify for myself that empirically, the mean of this new random variable is about a half, right? Which is the one over lambda, where lambda equals two. So I came pretty close, right? So this is a way that I can go from any, anything, or go from uniform to anything, right? Seems to work pretty well. So questions or comments about this? So there are a couple of caveats with this, right? So one is that in order to make this work, I had to be able to get the CDF in such a way that I could uh, undo it, right? And it may be that I don't always have access to that inverse CDF. So for example, the Gaussian distribution is a good example of something where I don't have the ability to compute the CDF directly, and so I can't compute the inverse CDF either. So let's just say that um, uh, this depends on being able to take the inverse CDF, which is not always possible to do, for example, like the Gaussian, we know we can't do it. That's what the whole point of the Q table is for. So there are other methods that you can use when you only have the PDF, right? So, um, when we only have the PDF, you can use something called the rejection method. <laughs> Some of you may already be familiar with the rejection method. Oh, snap. Sorry. Okay, so here's how that would work. So. <laughs> No, no, I thought about not saying that, but it's the last day of class, I can say what I want. So here's the way this works. So basically the idea is that um, you have your PDF, and for this to work, your PDF has to be uh, bounded, meaning that I can stop it at some point A over here, and then it's gonna be kind of inside this box here. So this B is definitely less than one, and this A is just some other um, place where the PDF stops, right? So here's the process for that. So first, again, I can generate 
um, basically a uh, uniform random variable in the range zero to A, and I can generate some other uniform random variable in the range zero to B, okay? So you can kind of think about this as generating a 2D point inside this rectangle, right? So I could generate this point, or I could generate this point, right? Just like basically making a, a coordinate inside here. And it turns out that the rejection method is very simple. It basically says that if my point lies inside here, this is like the region where I reject, and this is the region where I accept. So the process is basically saying um, if uh, the value that I generate here is kind of underneath the PDF at that point, then I return that u as my random variable estimate, okay? Otherwise, try again. Right? It's super simple, right? You don't have to know anything, just the PDF, and you keep on throwing darts at the PDF until you get one that's under the curve, and then you're done, right? And so um, I'm not gonna prove why that works. Actually, I put this as a final exam problem on one of my previous exams. So if you're working through the back finals, you will show for yourself why it works, but it's actually not that hard to prove that it's true. Um, and so this is pretty good, uh, except with the caveat that, again, it may take you a lot of tries to get a number that's under the PDF, right? That's kind of the problem, is that um, the number of tries you have to take to get under the PDF is unknown, and it may be a random number, and it may take you a long time, right? So that's not the, that's not the best method either, right? Um, in the sense that what I would like computationally is something that always takes me the same amount of time to generate a random number. I shouldn't have to worry about the gap between random numbers being generated, right? So um, kind of the drawback is that it may take um, many tries and kind of an uncertain number of tries. And actually, I think that, as you can see on the exam problem, I think the number of tries that you need is actually geometric, depending on, I forget what. Um, okay. There are ways to improve this method, but that's the basic idea. So this is okay. I mean, this, I could try to use this to generate Gaussian random variables, but um, it's not the best way. So there are, since Gaussian random variables are so often used, we would like to have a method that works for Gaussian random variables really well. And so there are a bunch of tricks for that. And, um, you know, so one, one way you could do it, uh, you could imagine is that you could use the central limit theorem and say, well, eventually everything becomes Gaussian, right? So what I could do is I could generate, like, 20 uniform random variables, and I know that that should look like a Gaussian, and then I could use that to approximate a Gaussian, right? But that would be a real waste of random variables in the sense that I'm generating like 20 uniform random variables for every single Gaussian I want to generate. That would be like a lot of extra computation, right? So instead, um, there are some slick methods, right? So um, to generate Gaussian random variables, here's a nice method. So first I generate um, U1 on this interval, and I generate U2 on this interval. And of course, these should be independent. I mean, also, let me just make a caveat that another really important property of the random number generator is not that it's giving me numbers in the right range, but also that as I generate the random numbers, they're independent, right? If they were dependent, that would be probably pretty bad for a lot of algorithms, right? We don't want random numbers to really depend on each other, and it's a little bit tricky, right? Because clearly the process that I showed you briefly before is deterministic, right? So how could those numbers not be uh, dependent on each other? That's where the magic is in trying to make a good generator such that there's no correlation or, independent, or dependence between the random variables. Anyway, long story short, I got two random variables. These just come out of MATLAB like rand function. And then I could let 
r equals this value. If you think about it, this number could be very big, right? Um, because this number is between zero and one. The log of that is some number that's gonna be basically between zero and you know, uh, minus infinity. Then I multiply it by negative two, so it's a big positive number. I take the square root. So this is some big positive number, possibly. And then theta, I'm gonna make as a two pi times this. So this is kind of like, I'm thinking about this as a radius and this as an angle. And then if I let x equals our cosine theta and y equals our sine theta, then x and y turn out to be independent uh, Gaussian random variables with zero mean and unit variance. So that's kind of nice. That means that I'm taking two uniform random variables and I come out with two Gaussian random variables. So it's not exactly one for one, but it's two for two, and that's about as good as I could expect, right? Um, so let's just do a quick verification that that works. So let's go back to my MATLAB for a second. So here, let's make, say, 10,000 uh, uniform random variables, and then let's make 10,000 more. My radius, I said, was gonna be uh, square root of minus two times log of one of these, and my theta is gonna be two pi times the other one, and then my x is r times cosine theta, oops, and my y is r times sine theta. And so again, if I look at the histogram of uh, my, one of these u's, should be uniform, right? And if I look at the histogram of either x or y, it should be Gaussian, right? So again, simple process for generating Gaussian random variables. You know, MATLAB does have a, um, you know, direct command called randn for generating Gaussian random variables. So if I want to generate Gaussian random variables directly, I could just look at that and I would get something that would be basically the same. So, you know, same kind of deal. Um, so you don't have to write this thing in MATLAB yourself, you can just use randn if you want to. But MATLAB, I guess if you look at it, there may be some other extra helper functions to generate other kinds of random variables, but between rand and randn, you should be able to build anything that you need based on what we just talked about, okay. Um, so comments or questions about this so far? All right, so let me just say a couple extra things, then we'll be done. So one is that, um, if we instead wanted to get like, oh yes, I'm sorry. If we instead wanted to get uh, normal random variables that had a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared, then what I could do is I could say, um, you know, I could create uh, one random variable that has zero mean and unit variance, and then I could make my other random variable, I can multiply it by sigma and add the mean, and then this would be distributed by what I want, right? So I can take anything, you know, if I, if I can make, this is like kind of like, uh, you know, MATLAB's rand n function. If I can make uniform, or I'm sorry, if I can make uh, kind of the standard random variable, then I can do anything else, okay? All right, so last thing I wanna talk about in this area is that, you know, typically everything we talked about so far is kind of making like one-off random variables, right? I kind of am just spitting out a bunch of independent random variables with a given distribution, right? But there are times when I want those random variables to be correlated, right? Maybe I don't want the random variables to be independent. How can I do that, okay? So, uh, so there are times, there are applications where um, we want to generate either like sequences, or a different way of thinking about this is like a vector, 
of correlated random variables. Right, so how could we go from uncorrelated or independent, I'm sorry, independent random variables to correlated ones, okay? So here's just an uh, example of how that would work just for Gaussians, okay? So um, let's suppose that, uh, suppose we want um, X and Y to be jointly Gaussian with the usual parameters, right? I've got the mean mu x by, I've got the variances sigma x squared, sigma y squared, and then I have, you know, what's called the covariance matrix, right? The covariance matrix is basically saying, how are these things related to each other? So if you remember back in our definition of the joint Gaussian, this two by two matrix, right, appeared in the formula for the Gaussian, okay? And if this row was not zero, that meant that those variables were correlated, okay? Remember this had to do with basically, I drew these, these pictures of equally probable regions and sometimes I had circles and sometimes I had tilted ellipses. This is like the tilted ellipse case where things are correlated, okay? So what would I do, okay? Well, you need to know some linear algebra to make this work. Again, this is kind of like a last day class kind of thing. So what I would do, if you know some linear algebra, is I would let the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this covariance matrix of sigma be, you know, lambda one V one, lambda two V two, right? So that's like saying that what I can do is I can take my sigma and I can decompose it like, you know, I can take the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues something like this, right? That's a way of decomposing the covariance matrix into the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That's what eigen decomposition means, right? Um, and now, if I had, um, if we had uh, A and B be IID, right, independent, identically distributed Gaussian random variables that came from, for example, MATLAB's RANDN command, I could go from these kind of very nicely behaved random variables to X and Y um, with this transformation. Where basically this, this square root of this matrix basically is saying I have square root of lambda one, square root of lambda two on the diagonal. So I could do some sort of jujitsu to say, okay, I can take the covariance matrix, take the eigen decomposition and get these V and D, and now I take the two random variables that I've got, which were previously well behaved, and I turn them into these two random variables that now have the desired joint PDF, okay? Um, and so, again, I'm not gonna talk too much about this, I'm not gonna prove it either, but that's just the idea is that I sometimes might wanna generate those kinds of random variables. Um, and MATLAB is, I'm sure, full of tricks for this kind of thing, right? So, um, again, the theory of how random numbers get generated is kind of interesting if you want to read more about the different kind of circumstances in which you might want to do it. Of course, MATLAB is trying to generate these random variables both as kind of, you know, fairly and, uh, you know, the best numerical properties as possible and the best statistical, statistical properties as possible, but also being able to do them in a computationally fast way, because you don't want to have to wait forever to get your random variables, okay? Okay, so, questions or comments about this? All right, last thing I want to talk about is kind of like big picture, right? So now, now we've done all this probability, it's kind of like what would be the next step, right? Where do we go from here? So, 
where to go from here. Like, why did we teach you all this stuff in the first place, right? So certainly, um, you know, if you ever take a course in, for example, communication theory, right? I'm not sure whether that's offered next semester or not, but there's a lot of probability in communication theory in terms of, you know, the probability of symbols getting transmitted across channels. And you should remember that when I did examples in class for electrical engineering, they were often using kind of like this transmission of symbols as a setup, right? Um, certainly anything that involves kind of like networking. So networking is kind of similar to communication theory, but it's more about things like, you know, uh, I've got my cell signals that are bouncing off of some cell tower and they're being, you know, queued up to be transmitted to the users. How does that whole process work of, you know, remember we kind of talked about this kind of Poisson exponential process where you've got, you know, customers that are lining up for a service, right? That's kind of like a networking problem. So anything that involves like queuing theory and markup chains and stuff like that. Um, certainly there's a lot of probability in machine learning, which I know is the hot thing. So to really understand what's going on under the hood of, you know, kind of machine learning theory, a lot of times you're going to need probability to understand what's really being done, right? Um, and so graphical models are one type of machine learning algorithm that deeply depend on probability, right? So Dr. G has a course on probabilistic graphical models, which kind of is half a computer vision course and half a probability course, right? So uh, that's really kind of critical to higher level understanding about machine learning. So then there's usually a course called, um, let's just say like um, stochastic signals and systems. It's called different things in different schools, but basically it's like an unholy hybrid of signals and systems and probability put together, right? So the idea is that you take everything that you knew about signals and you make it random, right? So suddenly you have random signals instead of deterministic signals, right? So um, the big concept there is the idea of a random vector, something like you have a vector of values and each of these is a random number and the vector itself, you know, basically these numbers are probably all correlated with each other, so there's some sort of covariance matrix that depends on all n variables at once, right? So there's like an n by n covariance matrix. Another key concept here is what's called a random process. So what's going on there is that you have something like, you know, over time, you have a random number that is, you know, kind of going up and down, right? So this could be like the stock market or your heart rate or something like that, right? So in this case, you know, instead of having discrete, you know, x1, x2, x3, you have a continuous x of 0 0.558, right? x of pi, right? So you've got something where it's like a line that doesn't have any gaps in it that is being drawn continuously. And you could ask questions like, you know, how is this number over here probabilistically related to this number over here, right? This kind of comes down to, you know, if you're interested in financial engineering, I guess I should put that here as a, as a key one, right? So financial, um, you know, engineering. I'm not sure what the right word for this is. But, you know, anything that's hedge fund managers trying to beat the stock market, stuff like that, it's all about probability in terms of you, you have this randomness in the system, right? And there's some lag and there's some correlations, right? A lot of that involves probability. Um, and what else? Certainly, like, um, you know, there's kind of like advanced uh, digital signal processing. So if any of you are taking, I guess that none of you in theory should be taking DSP right now because you probably are mostly taking signals and systems, but DSP is like the digital version of continuous time signals and systems. And so there used to be an advanced DSP course that we taught that basically had to do with how do you deal with developing systems that will process signals that themselves are random, right? Uh, we talked about that a little bit in the context of like the estimation theory stuff a couple lectures ago about like if I've got some sort of random input coming in, what's the best thing that I can do to that signal, for example, to predict what's going to happen next, right? Um, and so in an advanced DSP course, you'll probably be talking about some signals that have randomness. Um, and then something like detection estimation, there's a whole course on that. So um, we touched on that in the last couple lectures, but this idea of understanding, you know, like when 
a signal in one distribution has switched to another one, right? So have the, ha has the enemy started transmitting on this channel that was previously just static, right? And now it's suddenly not static anymore. That kind of notion of probabilistic change detection of going from one distribution to another is, you know, an interesting problem. And I think that that's, you know, there's lots of, you know, so I think basically uh, suffice it to say that, you know, when you first start studying electrical engineering, everything is pretty much deterministic. Then you take this course, and then you can start to see probability like leaking into all of your other courses, right? So this is probably not the last time that you will see the Gaussian distribution as a model for noise in a system, right? And so as you take 4,000 level courses, you'll probably start to have to remember some of this stuff. That's the whole point of putting it as a required course in the curriculum. So I hope that you'll appreciate that when you're struggling through problems in 4,000 level courses in the next year. That's it. So I hope you had a good time. and. Uh, I will see you all at the final exam. I have office hours tomorrow and office hours next week. And uh, that's it. Hope you had a good time.